Welcome to Candid Conversations. My name is Charles Schwinn. No one ever quit their job and started a business for a boring reason, including our guest today, Nick Haralumbus. Nick has started more businesses than the amount of characters in his surname. Welcome to the show, Nick. That's a very good observation. You're the first person to ever say that. Really? Is that so? Yeah. Well, high yeah. five to I myself. mean, I suppose over the, last, over the last few years, that's increased the number of businesses. So. <laughs> now, thinking about that today, how am I going to introduce Nick? Because I think for, <laughs> for a long time, people know you as Nick Harry, the Nick Harry Socks, but that was... The sock guy. Yeah, like the sock guy. Like, it's kind of like Daniel Radcliffe is known for. I have no idea who Daniel Radcliffe is. Harry, Harry Potter. I mean, Harry Potter. Ah, ah the, the Harry Potter guy. Okay. He's I, I never read a Harry Potter book. Look, neither have I, but I mean, the movie, he's forever glued to, he's forever known for True. that show. But anyways, True. so Nick, I want to say welcome to the show. Um, the first time I heard about you was when I was still working at a publisher site. You wrote for the publication for many years. I'm like, I like this dude. I like how you're always so you. raw and, and I listen to you on radios. And you know what? You're not scared to talk about failures. And that is what's beautiful because I'm pretty sure there's a lot of entrepreneurs outside. I mean, out there that they are dying inside, but they can't share with anybody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's part of the reason I kind of shifted towards that narrative. Um, and I, I, ironically, I actually shifted towards that narrative after a couple of successes, um, because post those successes, people were quite aggressive about um, me arriving at them. Um, for example, when I, I sold MoTribe, um, the first things people said to me were, oh, it was easy for you, you raised money. Mm. Or oh, you've got a privileged background, and those things are all true, uh, but they didn't make my experience of life less difficult. Um, you know, it's all relative. So I decided to start talking about the hardships and the failures, and um, trying to shift South Africans' perspective of failure that it isn't an end point. We see it as an end point, and it's not. It's actually a through point. It's something you need to progress through so that you can learn the lessons and iterate and get better at what you do. But if you're trying to avoid failure all the time, how do you know what's working or not? And I think we need to get over that fear, and South Africans are very fearful of talking about it. And that's kind of like the, the, the re-entering rate, so to speak. Um, if I remember correctly, in America, people stop trying after their third attempt but in south africa i think it's one and a half pretty and, much yeah that's absolutely right and i i really don't know i don't know if you know any anybody that tried their business first time and they became a huge success can you recall anyone uh, not off the top of my head i mean look i'm sure that they're out there um but the the funny part the more people i interview the more people i speak to the more entrepreneurs i interact with um they don't see failure in the same way that other people do. Uh, I've, I've now, I mean, I've got my own podcast, which I think we'll talk about later, but I haven't spoken to a single world-renowned entrepreneur who said to me, oh yeah, I failed often. They just glance through them. They just don't even acknowledge that those things exist. Mm -hmm. They fail, they see that it happens, they learn their lessons and they move on. Mm -hmm. And because it isn't an end point, they don't consider themselves failures. They're very resilient to that like, uh, that feeling of, oh my God, I failed. Um, so yeah, it's hard to find anyone who'd go, oh yeah, my first business failed because they don't see failure. They see it as learning. Yeah. Now, now I want to find out from you, if I, if I remember correctly, you started your first business at around 16 years old. So yep. you were in grade 10, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. What business was that? Uh, so I was lucky that my school... In grade 10, while you were choosing your subjects, or just before you chosen your subjects, they wanted you to get a feel for entrepreneurship. So in, I think, the first semester, they, they forced you to start a business as a kind of a side project um, for your business course. Mm -hmm. um, and so I decided to stick close to my roots and um, bought a ton of Greek worry beads that you kind of flick between your fingers. <laughs> and uh, I sold them to my classmates. Uh, they ended up getting banned at school because half the school was sitting there in class flicking these things uh, around their hands. Click, 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 um, click. Exactly. Um, but that was my first taste of, oh, okay, I took 500 Rand and I turned it into 1,000 Rand. Oh, there's something in this. Mm. Um, I didn't pursue it uh, the rest of high school, but that was my first business. And then I went off to Rhodes and carried on building businesses. What did you study? 
I, from the age of seven or eight, I knew that I wanted to be a journalist and study journalism. So I went to Rhodes to study journalism, philosophy and politics and uh, graduated with an undergrad degree in journalism that uh, did not lead me to the path of journalism. Hmm. Now, do you think that, I mean, learning journalism, learning philosophy, did it shape the way you think if, when it comes to an entrepreneur? Like, because as a as an entrepreneur, you have, you have to be able to communicate and verbalize your idea. Do you think journalism helped? Yeah, unequivocally. And it's it's actually funny. This year, I've started to kind of close that loop um, while I'm researching my third book called The Curiosity Catalyst. And I'm digging quite deeply into the concept of curiosity and how it feeds the brain and the experience of business in the world. Mm. And um, I'm starting to understand that diving deep and becoming a specialist at something, unless you're going to be part of the 0.01% that is at the top of that thing, it's not a good idea for anyone to be a specialist. So journalism, it helped me refine skills that widened my attention. Um, and that was really important. Same with philosophy and same with politics. Mm. I think what I was trying to do when I was 18, 19, 20 was grapple with the world around me and why is it the way it is? Mm. And business wasn't going to help me do that. Um, I understood, I think, deep down that I could build a business at any point, but there would be no other point in my life where I would have three years to just read about anything. And philosophy, politics, and journalism allowed me to do that. It allowed me to understand the narratives that were shaping the world, the philosophies behind the way we exist, and then the deep systemic um, existence of our democracies and where we came from, and how to thread those together to create a very macro view of the world. Okay. And I mean, now, obviously, I'm looking back at how that influenced me. But um, absolutely, those things allowed me to be curious and wonder uh, how could this be different rather than this is the way you build a business. Okay. And speaking of which, you mentioned that, uh, that, that growing up, um, now your parents, were they, were they entrepreneurs? Did they encourage that? Or so did my they dad, say, go um, get a job? I mean, what was it like? Yeah, they were good Greek parents. Um, they wanted better for me than they had. And that meant not being an entrepreneur and not suffering and not building something. They wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer or uh, some kind of science major, so much so that in high school, my, my father forced me to take science uh, in spite of me protesting, knowing that I wanted to be a journalist. I actually ended up almost failing matric because of science. I literally got the minimum amount required to get a university exemption. I literally, I'm not kidding, 33 and a third percent for science. Um, and they forced me on that path because that was the secure way to go. And I mean, I can't blame them for that. Mm. Uh, our default human experience is I struggled, the alternative is better. Mm. Um, so yeah, my dad is an entrepreneur. Um, you know, it's funny, a little segue on there. I'm trying to understand, and I've been working on this for a couple of years, the difference between a business owner and an entrepreneur. And I would argue that my dad is more of a business owner. Um, he didn't fill gaps and fix problems uh, and create new solutions in the world. He owned businesses to create a living. Uh, he would find a business that was uh, wanting to be sold and buy it and turn it around or uh, run a steers franchise or a fish and chips shop or the typical Greek uh, joke, he would open a corner cafe when they, we were struggling. And no jokes, that's what, what we did. Um, so I understand my dad's reluctance to pull me into that. And it was it frustrated me for many years because I had a teacher right in front of me who refused to teach. Um, and to this day, I, I still really don't get much uh, entrepreneurial guidance from my family. But they now obviously support everything that I've done. Wow. Okay. I mean, I, 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 I understand what you're saying because my mother, my grandmother that passed away a few years ago, she, she, she was uh, illiterate because she grew up in a poor family. And uh, um, because of that, she couldn't read, she couldn't write, but yet she started a little cafe and that was able to become quite wealthy and feed the family and send my mom and, and her two brothers to school. And uh, that always got stuck with me. And my mother is not on. She's not a business owner, nor an entrepreneur. She ended up um, getting a stable job teaching accounting. So I, I asked my mom last year, like, why did you not go into an entrepreneurship? Because when I decided to go on my own, my mom said the same thing. Oh, it's dangerous. What I mean, we fail. And then I realized through her talking is exactly what you said. My grandma said to my mom that my life is hard. Working seven days a week, opening shops, first to first to arrive, last to leave. Rather get a job so you can sit in an aircon room. 
And I, th- I suppose yeah. your parents wanted the same thing for you. Yeah, and I mean, it's, I suppose that's just a definition of privilege, um, you know, how you define privilege and success. Um, it is a big part of what I'm trying to tell people now is, especially in this era of lockdown, um, how do you define success and how, uh, what are your success and failure triggers? So when you've done X, you know you will have succeeded. Um, a friend of mine likes to say that when he's able to eat at any restaurant in the world and not look at the price on the menu, he'll feel like he's financially well off. Is he there and yet? One of your questions, uh, he's almost there. Um, one of your questions later is about my definition of money. And yeah. um, I think that definition of success is an interesting one, but I'm urging everyone to kind of figure out your own definition of success. And the mm. example that I use in the lockdown to help people jar into this um, opinion is, that expensive car that costs you seven, 12, 15 grand a month, it's been sitting in your driveway for two months now, not showing anyone that you're rich and wealthy and famous and smart. How does it feel now burning a hole in your pocket? Mm. And if that was your definition of success, maybe that needs to be changed. Mm. Exactly. So your, your grandmother and my grandparents and my parents, their definition of success was not what I have. Mm. Not, and my dad was the same. He'd come home six nights a week, because he did luckily get Sundays off and he would literally take his shoes off and go sit in the pool to cool his feet down because he would spend 15 hours a day on his feet Mm. every single night for six nights a week for as long as I remember. And he just didn't want that for me. And ironically, that's what I ended up doing. Seven, five retail stores and, you know, multiple days on my feet. Yeah. That's just Mm. the way it goes. Okay. So speaking about lockdown, I mean, what are you doing to keep yourself sane? Very little. I'm, I'm not saying, I don't think I could argue I was saying before that. Okay. Um, no, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, so I'm quite big on routine, um, uh, only re- of recent times. So like the last five years. Um, so my partner and I stick to routines as much as we can. Now that we're able to go and exercise in the mornings, uh, she goes for a run at 6.50, uh, at bang on six o'clock every morning. Um, she comes back, we walk the dogs for about 50 minutes, 60 minutes. Um, and then I just carry on with my routine of 10 to 20 minutes of meditation, as much exercise as I can bother in the week. Um, then an hour of writing, uh, producing content, just sticking to that as much as possible. But I'm also trying to indulge. Um, I think restricting yourself in this time is also a challenge. Mm. So uh, whereas I used to not eat sweet stuff, I'm a bit addicted to sweet stuff. Mm. Now I'm letting myself indulge. You know, it's, yeah. it's hard. Um, I'm also acknowledging that it is hard. Um, and I think a lot of people are trying to ignore that that's the case. Mm. But the truth is, the shit is hard. And mm. um, if you try and admit that it isn't, you're going to lose because mm. you can't beat this feeling. Um, depression comes and it's chemical and you just have to get through it. So I'm also acknowledging that that's okay. And then the last thing, I think the major thing is I separate church and state. Um, I've recently decided to work in certain hours and work in certain places. So my partner sits in one room in the house. We only have two rooms in our house. One is the kitchen, living room, dining room, and one is the bedroom. We live in a very small apartment. Um, so at five o'clock, we ex- exit our rooms and we, it's like we've come home from work. Um, wow, cool. Outside of that, we, we don't engage. We mm. have lunch separately because otherwise we're on each other all the time. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I'm trying to do as much as possible. Okay. And, and, and I know you, you recently uh, launched a new book. Can you tell us a little bit why launch it now? I mean, was that by design, starting a side hustle? Or was it by design to launch yeah. it right now? Yeah, it was. Um, it's something I've been playing around with in my head for a, a few months. Um, mm. So it's probably worth going back to January um, and uh, a question around what kind of business I'm in right now and why. Um, So in January, over the December holidays, I kind of looked at what I've been doing for the last couple of years and um, what I've been building and why and how and what my vocation is. I don't know if you've heard of um, Ikigai, the Japanese term for calling. Um, So I've kind of delved into that and realized that my Ikigai is more centered around storytelling. And um, every business I've ever built is just trying to tell a story of a problem that exists and a solution that I have. Um, but now I've, t- I've decided to take it a bit more literally. So January, I decided to focus on speaking, writing, uh, video content uh, as much as possible to add value to a community of people um, that I think need value. And that is anyone who's trying to improve their personal or professional lives. Mm-hmm. So with that in mind, started thinking about my second book, 
which has now actually become my third book. Um, and that is The Curiosity Catalyst. Um, that's also what the podcast is based on. But in the midst of that, this lockdown happened. And um, I realized that most people were probably going to be in desperate need of some financial assistance that Absolutely. our government just can't provide. Yeah. Um, I am very bearish on our government's ability to help people in a very practical way. There's lots of research that goes into um, the idea of charity, that giving to an organization is actually less effective than giving people money, yeah. just giving them actual cash. And there are yeah. actually charities that now allow you to do that. So I thought, what skills do I have that I can impart value to a community of people? And I've been building businesses for 20 years. I turned 36 this month. So it has now literally been 20 years. And I thought, let me write a short how-to on how to build a side hustle. And it's not a, how do you come up with ideas? If you've got an idea, my book is going to help you get over that first step of no one's going to want to buy this or where do I sell or why am I doing this? Imposter syndrome uh, in a way. A lot of the imposter syndrome stuff, mm. um, a lot of the failure stuff, um, a lot, it's very, it's philosophical in its origin, right? So building things, humans prevent, prevent themselves from doing that mostly because of fear. And mm. I deal with that fear and then the next steps afterwards. I've also taken that book now and turned it into an online course and a masterclass that all go hand in hand. So you can read the book, take the course, and then contact me for a masterclass where I help you work through these things um, more one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. And speaking about your podcast, I mean, I, I see the, the amount of guests on there and I was, uh, I was a bit blown away. Like, wow, you know, I mean, the, the one of the, I think this Tim, I forgot his surname, the, from, from Electronic Sports. Trip Hawkins. Yeah. I mean, wh I mean, out of all the people that you've met and interviewed, who is the most unforgettable one and why? It's, I mean, it's a good question. And the, the way you phrase it is interesting. So unforgettable for me, um, I would say one of the upcoming episodes is one of my favorite people that I know quite well. His name yeah. is Eric Herzman. Okay. He's the founder of Brick, Brick.com. Um, he's a Kenyan entrepreneur um, who founded the iHub, which is Africa's biggest um, accelerator or hub, technology mm -hmm. hub. Uh, he founded Ushahidi. And just Eric's approach to the world um, is just so unique and so interesting. He's one of these expert generalists that I, I, I talk about in my curiosity book a lot, um, that he's got this wide breadth of knowledge, but a depth of skill that, that makes him just like no one I've ever spoken to. And mm -hmm. um, something that really resonated that he and I spoke about was um, one of the questions I ask my guests is, you know, do you give yourself time to just be curious, to not fill your time? with a screen or a book or a something and Eric actually does um, whenever he's on a plane he refuses to take out a device he sits on the plane no matter how long the flight is and he just thinks and he makes notes about what he's thinking about and that's actually how he came up with the idea for his latest startup brick um, which is solving the wi-fi problem in very hard to reach rural areas in Africa and emerging markets um, so Eric is definitely one of the most memorable guests I've had but with that said, all of my guests are incredibly memorable in one way or another. Um, mm. From Rand Fishkin, who founded Mars.com, to Geraldine de Ritter, who is an award-winning James Beard, James Beard award-winning writer, to the founder of Unfido. Today's episode is the co-founder of Starbucks. So these are all incredible people, and it's very hard to put them uh, at the most memorable. But Eric, Eric definitely has a unique perspective. Okay, so how about if I rephrase a question? Who was interesting enough for you to want to invite back again? Will that change? So I think, I, yeah, it does. I think, um, I think Zev, the, the Starbucks co-founder, I've known him now for about five or six years. Mm. So I would say that he's probably someone with the most experience and knowledge um, in my area of interest. So Zev, mm. in spite of having started one of the biggest companies in the world, mm. he is a small business expert and has spent 50 years just digging into small business around the world, why it is the way it is, what kind mm. of founders succeed, um, what industries and what cultures produce more or less, and how he advises. So I think I've, I've spent enough time with him like once a month for the last five years that he's probably the guest I would have to give that to. Cool. And is there anybody else that's on your bucket list that you would love to interview one day, dead or alive? Dead or alive? Um, no, nobody dead. Um, you know, the, the person right now, there's two right now that are in my wheelhouse that I want to learn from and mm. therefore want to interview them. The first is Tim Ferriss and the second is Mark Manson. Okay. Why? Why Tim? 
Uh, I think that Tim is very, he's a very clear thinker. Um, and I, I like to speak to people like that. I like to understand why he makes the decisions he makes and how he gets to those points. Most of us fill our days with stuff so that we don't have to think. And Tim strikes me as someone who gets rid of stuff so that he can think. Mm. Um, and I like that. The other one I want to add to that list is Brene Brown. Uh, uh, she, yeah. she comes across as very cheesy content, but every time I listen to her, I learn something new about myself. Mm. Okay, so speaking about Tim Ferriss, uh, he, because you were speaking about depression, did you know that in, in, in varsity, I think he got into either Stanford and he was so, he was so um, unhappy, he actually went to look up a book on how to kill yourself, on suicide. And uh, he, the, the, in the book, he, for, he forgot to change his postal address. So the book actually arrived at his home address where his folks are. So his mother got worried and actually phoned him. He's like, listen, what's going on? And he cleverly diverted to say, no, no, no. It's actually that book is for somebody else. One, a friend of mine, he's going through doing some research stuff. So had he gone, gone ahead with it, we would not know Tim Ferriss. There you go. Yeah. So whoever, whoever might be getting feeling a bit depressed right now during this lockdown, don't do it. You might just be the next Tim Ferriss. It's like, it will be okay. Yeah, and look, on that point, I mean, if you are, and, and it is a tough time, if you yeah. are, go out and seek help. I mean, I see a psychologist once a month, even in lockdown. Mental health is a very real issue that most entrepreneurs don't deal with. And the way that I like to try and phrase it um, to male South Africans, because we struggle the most with talking about this shit, is if professional athletes can have physical coaches and dietary consultants, why can entrepreneurs not have a mental coach? Absolutely. That's how I position seeing a mm. psychologist. Go and see someone to help you get through your mental anguish because you, you can and it's okay. It's, it's like we don't have to do it alone, right? No man is an island. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So I wanted to find out from you. So let's say if one day um, or if, if there's a, if there's a, a big ass billboard out there that you can carry on any message to the world, what would you say? Mr. Nick? Right now, um, the, the phrase, so I've got 10 Nickisms that I live by. They're like my, my own little Nickisms. Mm -hmm. They're my worldview summed up in 10 statements. And the one that rings the most true right now for me is offense is taken, not given. Okay. If you're offended, you should consider why you are offended, not if that person meant to offend you. Mm. And the things that I, 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 the reason that's top of mind right now is the debate between lockdown or open economy. Yes. And the world believes that this is a binary debate and it mm. is not a binary debate. Just because Nick and I do, just because I believe we should open the economy does not believe that we should murder people by <laughs> letting the COVID disease spread. Mm. Those things are not binary. And um, so I wish that people would realize why they take offense, not if I'm giving offense. Mm. That's a very fresh perspective. I've never heard that before. Thank you for that. That gives me some, sure. some, fruit, some fruit for thought. So as a last question, I mean, do you think uh, entrepreneurs should, should be taught at school level? Why and why not? Yeah, so it's a good question and one that I, I have strong opinions on. Um, I do think that entrepreneurship should be taught at school, um, but not in the straightforward way that we teach school right now. Um, my depth of research into curiosity has led me to wonder why some kids and some cultures are more curious and successful after school than others. And one of the systems that I've discovered is the Finnish school system. And the Finnish school system have a really simple statement that sums up their school system. There should never be a dead end for a child. Now, that is the perfect way for me to understand how school would have been better for if, when I was at school. Imagine a company where they don't tell you which job they're hiring you for. They just hire you because you're the best at what you do. And they don't care what you do for them. They just know that you'll make an impact. That's how the Finnish school system operates. Mm. They say, Nick, you, you want to be a business person? Rad. How do we make you the best business person we can make you over the next 12 years of school? And they never let you go to a place where you have a dead end when you finish school. So if you get to year 12 and you realize you're going to be a crappy business person, they go, cool. What skills did you learn that we can now repurpose into mm. something else? They never let you get to a point where you have failed. 
And I just don't believe that the school system as we know it today is equipped to do that for most of us, especially in a place like South Africa. Yeah. Not every kid should be a science major. And this is that old saying that if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll always feel like a failure. Absolutely. That's what science was for me. I was never meant to do science. I was never meant to do math. I was meant to practically practice the act of doing numbers so that my business can make sense. I can do a business spreadsheet better than any mathematician. Don't ask me to solve for X. I don't understand it. So unequivocally, I think entrepreneurship should be taught to those who show an interest in entrepreneurship. We should nurture that and make that a thing from as young as we can identify that. But don't teach it to people who don't want to know about it because then they're going to feel like failures because that's not cool. So I think it's, it's again, it's not binary. Mm. Look, I really hope that is the case one day because um, I've been telling people for years, like in school, they don't teach you how to be a business owner, entrepreneur. They teach you how to be a good employee because they teach yep. you there's only right and wrong answers. And if you get the wrong answer, sorry, you fail. But in life, we fail every single day. I mean, that's, 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 that's yeah. how we learn, right? I mean, I think fundamentally, though, that doesn't even just apply to school um, in science. Mm. If you get to the end of your matric uh, exam and you've answered a couple of answers wrong, you've failed. That is not how science works. Yeah, 12, science 12, 12 years down learning. I mean, what is it, 12 years, nine years down, down the grade? Yeah, exactly. And that just fundamentally is not how life is. Mm. Even science, the practice of science is about learning what doesn't work so that you can iterate and find out what does work. Science is not one exam. It's mm. theoretical and consistently learning what doesn't work. So just the fundamental basics of our school system are broken and the South African pass rates, math rates, science rates, literacy rates show mm. that what we are doing does not work. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Nick, thank you so much for your time. And listeners, if you enjoy the show, please click like, comment, or subscribe. Nick, what a pleasure. Thank you one more time. Thanks for having me.